Good morning, brothers and sisters and family of Bridgepoint Church. Also, welcome to those of you who are maybe visiting us for the first time. Uh, we are grateful that you joined us for worship this morning. I'd like to invite you, if this is your first time, uh, as is our custom here in the fellowship, is each week we take uh, the opportunity to participate in the Lord's Holy Supper and uh, Holy Communion, also known as the Holy Eucharist. So if you need to uh, grab some of those items, I'd like to invite you uh, to go ahead and do that now. That will be a juice, cracker, uh, bread or wine, whatever it is that you would like to partake in the Lord's Supper with, to go ahead and get those things together. A couple of weeks ago, um, we got a message uh, entitled, What Now? Uh, in our time of transition, and so uh, one of the first points that we talked about was returning to worship. We also talked about uniting in prayer. And we then talked about and we spoke of standing up. So last week, we uh, really looked at a lot of details in terms of what it means to return to worship. So today we're going to look at details uh, regarding what it means to really engage in prayer. And specifically, the focus and the emphasis of prayer is that of what it looks like participating in group prayer. So I want to go ahead and to direct your attentions now uh, to the book of Revelations, uh, chapter 5. We'll be in book of Revelations, chapter 5. And uh, I'd like to go ahead and pray now uh, for the message. Please join me. Dear God in heaven, thank you so much for who you are, you and your great being, and that we get the opportunity to participate and to engage in your holy, enduring word. Uh, you have communicated to us that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word endures forever. So we put our trust in your word, God. We set ourselves on this holy and divine foundation that it will inspire our lives. We seek to be closer to you. We seek to be known by you. We seek to be used by you. Open our minds, God. Open our hearts. It is certainly in Christ's name that we submit ourselves to you. Amen. So uh, this morning in uh, Revelations chapter 5, again, if uh, we can consider the title of today's message, uh, which is, And When You Pray. The title for today's message is, And When You Pray. The reason for the title of this message is because uh, Jesus, uh, during his Sermon on the Mount, would give some instructions on prayer. And so uh, he begins uh, that instruction of prayer with the uh, dependent clause of, and when you pray, and then it continues. And so he gives some details. He, he gives details like, you know, when you pray, don't babble on, right? Uh, so we, we get from that, you know, that when we pray to God, we don't have to keep rambling about things. He also says and encourages us that when we pray, don't do it to be seen by people. You know, uh, the, really the context of much of the instruction that he gave during that time was to not do, quote unquote, righteous acts to be seen by people or to, be, uh, to, to gain the attention of people, but to do it to gain the attention of God. You know, and so uh, we're going to be looking at some things today. So I'm going to just share with you uh, a few passages that really, uh, I pray, will speak to your heart, really encourage and inspire perhaps something new for you to consider uh, when you engage with God in prayer. And specifically, uh, these points are meant to emphasize how we can engage in prayer with partners and engage in prayer with a group of people. Uh, but also take in mind that some of the things that we'll be looking at are certainly applicable to you as an individual as you go to God uh, in your own personal time. So, Revelation chapter 5, we'll be in verses uh, 6 through 8. And it says this, John shares, Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. 
The lamb has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat at the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. And each one had a harp and they were holding. I love this part. They were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Very powerful. <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite scriptures uh, and passages really in the book of Revelations right here in chapter five. It says that God has our prayers in golden bowls, the prayers of people. And uh, again, the emphasis of the message is things that we can apply and we can consider in group prayer, but also things that we can consider in individual prayer. You know, uh, what comes to mind with incense is that there's a fragrance, right? You know, we all sometimes burn incense in our homes, and, uh, and, we, and we do it to create an atmosphere. We do it to create uh, an aroma, and an aroma that's pleasing, right? We don't want aromas that are not pleasing. We know what not pleasing aromas are, right? Um, but there is an aroma that comes up before God when we engage in prayer, and not just menial prayer, but when we engage in intentional prayer, and when that prayer, uh, and in that prayer, when there's connectivity with God. So connectivity, in terms of creating an aroma with God, the connectivity is key. Connectivity is key. So prayers, for me, when I think of prayer, is that prayers are our intentional thoughts and our intentional emotions that we intentionally express towards God. And he hears them. It's a divine communication, and it is a divine interaction that, that occurs. It is, in fact, a manner and a level of worship. And once again, we see here in the scriptures that God actually, like, he relishes in our prayers that are submitted to God. You know, uh, here are a couple of things to think about with connectivity being key. You know, it's, again, and Jesus gives the instruction, we don't have to babble on to God. We don't have to keep rambling to God. He knows our hearts. You know, another thing is, with connectivity being key, how can we actually gain that connectivity? Connectivity is really all about the, the emotional attachment and the emotional drawing of God. What can we do to actually gain that emotional drawing of God? You know, for me, and, and, and I'm just saying these are some of the things that I incorporate in my own personal prayer life, and it helps to change. It has helped to really uh, uh, bring metamorphosis in my spiritual life. You know, I've learned to not just pray, but I've also been recently incorporating the meditation of God. Sitting before God and being still not saying anything, not making any requests, getting rid of all of my preoccupations and sitting before God and just uh, uh, allowing myself to hear his voice, getting and gaining to a point of stillness, right? Learning to breathe before God, taking in breath and breathing out breath, that I'm breathing in the blessings that I'm, I'm breathing in his presence. You know, uh, one of the words that I've been personally focusing on is Jehovah Shammah, which is God is present everywhere. So I'm breathing in his presence and I'm breathing out my preoccupations. I'm, I'm breathing in his goodness and, and then I'm exhaling all of the negative stuff that I get to see and or hear about. And I, and I put it towards God. It's been amazing and revolutionizing my personal prayer life. Another thing over the past uh, year or so is I've been uh, really intentional on incorporating my body in prayer. What does that mean? I can imagine that, you know, uh, I mean, well, God sees everything. But if you all were to have a camera and you were to watch me praying, you would think that I was a, a fool. <laughs> You'd think that I was a crazy man because sometimes... 
when I'm praying and I'm and I'm emotional, I'm gaining that emotional connection and I'm wanting God to feel my connection. Sometimes I'm walking around and I will leap before God. Because that's my level of involvement and excitement and my passion about whatever it is that I'm either communicating to him or that or what is being reciprocated. There are times when I I get on my knees. There's a park that I go to sometimes, but I will and there's a shelter. I will get on my knees and I will bow down in his presence. I will put my forehead on the ground and I will stretch my arms out and worship him. Uh, again, and, and this, is, this is my own personal space. Nobody is around. Nobody's watching. But this is me. This is my personal act of worship. You know, and, and there comes the words, you know, hallelujah, that I can give to God because hallelujah is the highest praise. So I'm doing that in my own personal prayer life. It has revolutionized my connectivity with God. So I like to I like to give that because I want I want my fragrance before God to be a sweet smelling fragrance, right? I don't want it to be a bad fragrance. I, I don't want it to be a bad fragrance like a bad baby diaper or something, right? I, I'm a dad. I, I, I love the babies. I, I love but diapers, especially the bad ones, I don't want that, right? <laughs> Get that out of here. But I'm God's child. But what also encourages me is this is that even when I'm at my stinkiest, when I go and I connect to God, it still comes up before him as a sweet smell and as a sweet aroma. When you are, when you are praying to God, ensure that you are connected. It's not about the amount of time. You can actually engage in prayer with God for about three minutes. And if you, are, if you leave that prayer time resolved, that you have made connection with God, then you've accomplished what you've needed to accomplish or to say God has accomplished with you what he desires to accomplish because God desires connectivity with you. He desires connectivity with us. You know, I was praying about, you know, or I said something about babies. It makes me think about my kids as well when I think about con connectivity. Because uh, th uh, th this first point really is all about the transmission. When we pray to God, there's a, th th there are words and expressions that are transmitted to God. And then conversely, as, there's, as there is counter-transference, uh, there is a transmission that is reciprocated and it comes back to us as people. The transmission is so important to engage it, it, because it, it creates family. It creates an atmosphere. Hey, now that I, I, I'm talking about family, I want to give, give this quick shout out. Parents, pray with your kids. No matter how old they are, you make the initiation to pray with them. If you, if you have an infant child, pray with your infant. Pray with your infant child. Uh, uh, allow your child to know and to understand and to hear your prayer voice. If you, if, you have, if you have a child that's 20, 30 years old, call your child and pray with your child. I'm reminded of times when, when my son was an infant and he was a toddler. I would go on prayer walks, and, uh, and at least probably uh, seven to eight months old, I would lift him up, put him on my shoulders, and I would walk around for about 30 or 40 minutes and it's just he and I praying. My son was my prayer partner. But that, that's me, but you can do the same thing, right? I think about my daughter. I actually just got a, I literally just got a phone call from her uh, about 10 minutes before service. Uh, she, she called to tell me something. Uh, but I really appreciate what God is, has been able to develop through our relationship through the years. My daughter will be 20 years old soon, but you know what will happen sometimes when we're engaged in conversation? When three o'clock comes, I grab her by the hand and I say, hey, baby, let's pray together. And I can pray with my daughter, and it encourages me and inspires me to hear the things that's also on her heart that she prays. Connectivity is key. So, two, quick, two other quick things that I want to give you is that, and when you pray, I'd like for you to consider the transference 
of what happens. So let's look at the transfer of, of what happens when we engage in prayer, whether that's us individually or whether we're doing that uh, in a prayer group. Acts chapter 16, again, uh, only two verses we're going to look at, verses 25 and 26. Very uh, popular and still yet powerful passage. And it goes as such, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and, and singing hymns to God. I want to start over. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all of the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. I just want to stop right there. First of all, it's midnight. We're at the darkest hour. We're at the hour of challenge. The hour when, when, it's, at its, when it's at its thickest and most intense. In the midnight hour, we have two people joined together in solidarity, and they not only begin praying, but they also incorporate singing with their prayers to God. I'm just saying, I'm wondering what they were actually singing about. I'm wondering what they were actually praying. But once again, God relishes. It gets his attention. Now, when we pray individually, we certainly get God's attention. But when we can come together and we can agree with someone else in prayer, think about how that is amplified. And then the further amplification of those prayers being exacted when singing is incorporated. You know, this is a reminder to one of the points that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, and that is bringing passion to God. They were in jail. They were, they were bound up. They were shackled. They were held captive. Against their desire, against their will, they were held captive. That reminds me of a story in 2014. You might say, 2014, what, what's so significant about that? Well, many of us remember that there was a young man here in the city of Atlanta who was kidnapped. He was about uh, 10 years old at the time, or 12. Nevertheless, he was a young boy. He was kidnapped by two guys. And in 2014, he could have sang any song he wanted to to try to keep himself calm or to keep himself inspired or whatever. He could have, in 2000, I looked up some of the, uh, because kids know songs, right? Uh, we know that. They listen to the radio. They're up on the songs before we really know what they are. So I can imagine in 2014, you know, some of the popular songs that were out was Turned Down for What by Lil John. He could have been singing that while sitting in the back of a kidnapped car. He could have been singing Don't Tell Him. Well, no, nah, he wouldn't want that. He would want people to know. He could have been singing Happy by Pharrell to keep his spirits up. But of all of the songs that he could have considered singing, he begins to sing Every praise is to my God. He's singing Hezekiah Walker, and he's singing, he's singing every praise over and over and over and over again. It drove the kidnappers to the point to release him. They threw him out of the car. I'm just saying, now, I'm not a kidnapper, but if somebody's just singing every praise over and over and over again in my car, I'll we'll probably put them out too. No disrespect to Hezekiah Walker. Uh, I like the song, but I can't do without uh, hearing it because uh, we can wear songs out. Uh, that's, pers that's a personal note right there. But he was, I'm sure he was praying, and he is bringing his heart to God, his trust to God. Again, he could have sang anything, but... He got God's attention, and God heard it. I'm sure that young man was praying. I'm sure of it. But in those prayers, in his, in his moment of captivity, 
he knew and he was inspired to actually pray and sing songs to God. What does your passion look like before God? One of the other things in this very powerful uh, passage of Scripture about Paul and Silas at midnight is that their doors were broken open. Paul and Silas's chains were snapped. Their shackles were broken. Here's the beauty of that passage. It wasn't just their chains that were snapped. It wasn't just their shackles that were broken. The Bible says that all of the prisoners that were listening to them, their, their doors also broke open. Their shackles were also snapped. Their, their shackles, were, their chains were also broken. Who are the people around you that can benefit from your prayers? Who are the people that can benefit from you joining in prayer and solidarity and prayer of agreements with somebody else? And their chains are broken. There are people in dark places just like you. Sometimes Satan will try to trick us and make us think that we are the only ones struggling. And it doesn't minimize what we are going through. However, there are other people who are in the fight and other people who are in the struggle, other people who are suffering. And God wants to also release them and break their chains. The fact that you know to engage in prayer, I, I love it because in the passage it says that the other prisoners were listening. All they, were, they were just listening. But I can imagine sometimes like when you're just listening, uh, and especially like if you hear something over and over and it's repeated, you might start, you might start joining in. Right. So I can imagine some of the prisoners may have been inspired to also pray. They may have been inspired to sing along. And then God not only pours out a blessing to the people who initiated it, but to the community that surrounded them. We live in a time, of course, where there are people around us that need our prayers if you, are not, if you are not praying, start praying. We need to be, we need to be praying more than ever. We, we need to be sending up that incense to God more than ever. And, and I just want to say, and not just because we're trying to get something. God is so worthy. He deserves our prayers. He deserves our energy, our passion, and to be able to sing. Is not God waiting on his people to pray like never before, to also loose the chains of other people who are held captive? Is not God wanting to set other people free in addition to you? Again, part of, part of your role as a disciple and as a Christian is to reflect God. And to reflect God means that you're not the only beneficiary, but that your benefits uh, gets to be permeated to a group of people with whom he allows to come through and to be in your presence. Who do you know that needs to be set free? Who do you see that needs to be set free? You might be watching this message and you're saying, yeah, I know some people that need to be set free or I know some people who have been free. Maybe you need to be free. Are you somebody this morning that needs to be set free. Are you ready to be set free? It amazes me sometimes because we can pray about something. God will open our prison doors. He'll break our shackles, and we'll still sit in the cell. We see the doors open. We see God has done a miraculous thing, and we'll still just sit there. God is saying, I've opened the door. Get out and walk. Come out of that condition. I've, I've made the pathway straight. The light is at the end of the tunnel. The doors are open. You have nothing stopping you. Go. Run to the light. Are you ready to be set free this morning? It, I, I hope and pray that you are. I hope and pray that you are now making the decision to come in contact with the blood of Jesus. Third thing I want to talk about is the transformation. And when we pray, we need to consider the transformation that can happen in our lives. And this right here is from the same writer who shared in the, in the book of Acts. So we're, uh, this is Luke. 
And Luke 9, chapter 28, uh, chapter 9, verses 28 through 31. We'll go ahead and start reading there. And it goes like this in this particular account. Jesus took with him. In fact, this is one of my favorite scriptures and passages about Jesus. He took with him Peter and James and John, and they went up to a mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. And they appeared in glory, and they were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. What continues to enamor me about Jesus and how he prayed to God is this transfiguration. Like, to know that when he prayed to God, for instance, and it brings up Moses. And, and we read in the Old Testament, Moses, you know, in, in the book of Exodus, you know, whenever he went towards God and whenever he prayed to God, when he went to the tent of meeting, when he entered the Holy of Holies, when he came out, uh, his, his, his face was too bright for people to look at because he had encountered God. So he had to walk around with a veiled face so, that, so as to not overwhelm the people. Jesus, when he prayed, like this light was so overwhelming, it blinded him. In fact, it, it, and it wasn't just his face. It was his entire body completely illuminated before God. Like Jesus' whole body was shining. Okay, wh what is the point? Number one, again, I talked about this is, this is applicable whether you're doing prayer, engaging in prayer individually, or whether you're engaging in prayer in groups. Okay, whether you do it individually or whether you're in a group, when you enter God, you should enter God with the intentionality of coming out shining. Don't just pray, but enter with the intentionality of coming out shining before God, that you enter prayer expecting to be changed. And you can do that, again, individually, and you can do that with a group of people. You know, the Bible does say that Jesus left us an example that what? That we should follow in his steps. You know, whether you are alone or in a trusted group, intentionality in prayer is key. You know, we, we saw where, where passion is key, but intentionality is also key. The Bible says that when, he, when his appearance changed, everything about him changed. They even, they, they, saw, they saw divinity. They, they saw the, the patriarchs of old, Moses and Elijah. Not only that, I can imagine that because Peter, James, and John were there, this was an experience that they also had. And I can imagine that after that experience, it changed their lives. It changed their behavior. I can imagine that after that experience of group prayer, they walked differently. Man, it was so powerful. Jesus told them, he said, hey, don't even say anything about this. But they would later, of course, because we have it recorded right here in the Bible. But it was so powerful. I can imagine they began to walk differently. They began to talk differently. It was, a, it was an elevated level of faith. There was a transformation. They began to do everything different. They, I, I can imagine that even though Jesus was dazzling white, I, I, I guarantee they looked different in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Are you ready to look different? You, perhaps you could be somebody out there, and you just, you've been saying to yourself, man, I really need something different in my life. Well, what does your prayer life look like? If you're wanting that difference, if you are wanting that change, what does your personal prayer life look like? What does your prayer life look like joined in with others? What are you trying to accomplish? That was a phrase that really stuck out to me because it says that Moses and Elijah, they were talking to Jesus about his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. 
What are you trying? What are you trying to accomplish for the rest of this year? What are you trying? What, what do you have in mind and have in heart to accomplish? You could have something in mind that you're trying to accomplish just over the next couple of days. I got two papers I need to write, and I definitely need to accomplish that <laughs> right after this service, right? And, and they aren't any punk papers either. I, I need to get them things done. I'm trying to shine before God in, in everything that I do. But there could be something that you're trying to accomplish within the next two weeks. You could have in mind things that you're trying to accomplish during the year 2021. And I want to and I want to let you know this, that regardless of what the year brings, you still have a responsibility to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. No matter who's elected or reelected, you're still expected to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You're still expected to accomplish something. In fact, it could be the call to accomplish something greater as a result of the societal changes that happen around you. What are you trying to accomplish? We didn't read this particular scripture, but when you continue to read on, and I'm sure that you uh, may have seen it as you have your Bibles in front of you, is that God pronounced and gave affirmation once again to who Jesus was. In that, in, in that level, in that height of connectivity, he said, this is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. You know what? When you engage in that level and height of connectivity and prayer to God, individually and certainly and with a group of people, God wants to pronounce something on you. God is looking to give you words of affirmation. You know, we, we all have that love language in our life. He's looking to give us that, uh, that love language, those words of affirmation. This, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. He's looking, at, he's looking at you, some of you women out there, some of you sisters. He's saying, he wants to say, this is my daughter, insert name, my beloved. With her, I am well pleased. Listen to her. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. God wants to pronounce something great over your life. Allow him to do that by engaging in prayer and allowing that intentionality of expecting change and transformation in your life uh, to, to uh, 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 capture your heart and to capture your mind and whatever it is that you contemplate before God.